Peter Blanc in Washington, D.C. at ACC 17. With me is Michael Mack from Dallas, Texas. Uh, now, we know from previous uh, trials that TAVR produces a lot of debris that goes north to the brain, and yet the brain seems to absorb it. The brain is a sponge, or at least is a resilient organ. And now Mike has an NIH grant that has looked at the same issue in cardiac surgery. So Mike, tell me about the trial. So the trial was sponsored uh, by the NIH in what's called the Cardiothoracic Surgery Network, which is 38 sites in the United States and Canada. We randomized patients between two mechanistically different methods of embolic protection. One, a capture device placed in the ascending aorta. The other, a device that's a side port on the aortic cannula that aspirates debris. Um, there were a common control group, and there are 383 patients randomized. So essentially, you're just sucking up everything that goes by. Correct. Okay. So you did that during your surgery and uh, during rewarming and all that other good stuff. Yes. Yep. Okay. So what did you find, Mike? So the trial did not meet its primary endpoint. It was stopped three quarters of the way through enrollment by the DSMB for anticipated futility to reach the primary endpoint, which was the incidence of clinical stroke and radiographic stroke by diffusion weighted MRI, which was done on all patients. Okay. So let me ask you, because in TAVR, every one of those devices accumulated a lot of gunk, a lot of debris. What did you see? So virtually all patients had embolic debris to the brain, and unfortunately neither of these devices were we able to demonstrate a decrease uh, in the volume of lesions to the brain. Uh, it looked like there is a decrease in large infarcts with the embolic protection device. Um, but it was the trial did not meet its primary endpoint. Very similar to the Sentinel trial, uh, which used virtually the same primary endpoint in TAVR. So what did we take home from all this, Mike? I mean, this is really a strange business. The brain is a lot more resilient, clearly, than we thought. But what does that tell us about going forward, and what about long-term results? Well, we captured debris and you know aortic valve tissue, aortic wall tissue, myocardium in virtually all patients. All I know, if you look at this stuff, I don't want to go into my brain. Intuitively, this makes sense. And we probably just picked the wrong primary endpoint. We also found that about a quarter to a third of the patients had baseline disease ahead of time, and those are the ones that are most vulnerable. What we're going to do is follow these patients out for five years with neurocognitive testing to see whether all this brain injury has ultimate long-term significance in terms of dementia long-term. Uh, I mean, long yeah, it'd be awful if everybody that had a TAVR or an aortic valve replacement got, health, got, uh, got Alzheimer's 20 years later. Well, that's exactly true, and you know, we always talk about post-pump brain. I think mechanistically we figured out what that is. It's both gaseous and particulate emboli, but we haven't figured out exactly how to prevent it yet, despite two different methods of, of doing it. We think that going forward, an enriched population of those most vulnerable, uh, will, in all likelihood, will be able to show a difference. Okay, so one last question and we'll quit. Do you think that we'll be doing this for every TAVR and for every aortic valve replacement in the future? All I know is when I get my TAVR or my surgery, I want protection. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. A lot of stuff goes north. The brain seems to tolerate it, but long term, no answers yet. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Peter.